Welcome back to Talk of the Town on 99.7 and 1450 WHTC on WHTC.com and on the WHTC app for your smartphone. Once again, here's your host, Gary Stevens. Welcome back to Talk of the Town for this Wednesday, December 27th. Normally the fourth Monday of the month, we are joined by third-term Republican State House Representative Brad Slomp. But because we were not airing a program on Christmas, we're very pleased to have the representative join us on this day. State Representative Brad Slaw, good morning and uh, Merry Christmas. Happy New Year to you, sir. Uh-huh. Gary, thank you for the invite to be here today and the opportunity for me to be in and speaking to your illustrious <laughs> uh, folks out there. And by the way, if you have a question for State Representative Brad Slaw, He'll be happy to answer it at 616-395-1450, 616-395-1450. Uh, as a matter of uh, transparency, Brad's Law is also the state representative where I live. So um, I, I put that out in transparency. There we so go. I, I, I'm a person that can talk to my state representative, and you can too. Even if you aren't living in his district, 616-395-1450. Brad, before we touch upon some of the topics that we had discussed and beforehand, I do want to bring this up as somebody who's asking a member of the state Republican Party in terms of the delegation. December 27th was supposed to be a special meeting dealing with the state Republican Party and some issues involving its leadership. I don't know how involved you are, but there are some who are not happy with the direction of the state Republican Party is going in right now. Uh, others are saying that uh, it's going just fine and that reports of bankruptcy is and uh, uh, being millions of dollars or oodles of dollars in the red and not getting donations are completely fabricated. Can you try to settle this or, or, or at least give us some direction about where the state Republican party is going right now? Yeah, I'd, I'd like to be able to give you really a settled answer, but I think the, that isn't necessarily available right at the moment. Um, there is uh, opportunities for folks, you know, as they, as they set up the party this time, um, and, and elected leadership there, they have somehow disenfranchised many of the folks who were givers in the past. And so some of the big dollar, uh, donation folks that have, uh, provided dollars for the Republican party in the past, just seem to have kind of backed away from that at this point in time. Um, that's a concern, um, to many of the folks who have been longtime party, uh, members, um, there's some the positive side about who they've elected and put into leadership uh, for the Michigan Republican Party is that there's some new ideas and some new blood and and we need that because you know people continue to to leave this world and they're not involved in politics once they leave the world I can I can pretty much attest to um, and so I think there's there's a both and piece to it Gary and I I don't know that we're going to see the end of that right away. Um, and I am not involved in the voting, anything that's going on today, uh, the 27th. And I just, so we'll have to wait and see where things shake out. How important is it to get the GOP house in order in order to have an impact this coming November, especially with the state house and the possibility of it being flipped? Right. So there, that's a really important time frame. Um, just, the state house, I believe, is working on trying to, to work a plan that says we can raise money and be involved even without a centralized Michigan Republican Party. Um, we're just, we aren't sure what's going to transpire out of that whole thing. And so we're working on on the house, trying to raise the funds and do the work to make sure that we can actually get elected and, and have a majority for the Republican Party in the state house uh, coming up in November. If you have a question for State House Representative Brad Slaw, 616 395 1450. Let's stay on the topic of the State House right now with two members of the House, no, no longer members of the House because of the results of last month's election. 
uh, that's as basically a domino effect, doesn't it? Yeah, there's some really interesting things. So we were uh, two mem- the Republicans were two members short of being in uh, either tie or ma- I guess one member short of being a tie, uh, two members short of being a majority. And with the elections, two House of Representative members, both Democrats, um, had filed to become mayors. They won their elections. They've resigned from the House, so they're, it's now at a tie, a 54-54 um, votes. Um, that leaves the, the opportunity for uh, just being able to run stuff the way that the, Repub- the Democratic Party that was in majority just ran things um, the first part of, the, of our legislative term. It's now changed. The, that's not going to be quite so easy to do. Um, they're still in majority. They still hold the gavel. They still get to choose what gets up on the board, um, but it will, it will definitely change things. And now there's, uh, some redistricting questions, uh, based on a lawsuit that was filed. So there's now questions in that, from that lawsuit, because there's at least one house district that's got to have that, that lost a person to being a mayor, um, that now has to get revoted in. So how are you going to do that? And what is the actual boundaries of that district? Because it looks like it's going to have to change at least a little bit um, just based on what's happened before. And will that decision then be made by this uh, uh, nonpartisan commission that lost two commission members already? Yeah, actually, they're down three. Okay. Um, at, based on the latest stuff that I was reading this morning, one had resigned a week ago-ish, and two more resigned like over the last couple of days. Um, so we're, what happens to that redistricting commission? I don't really know, but it looks like the, the way the court has done it. Um, it could be that they just bring in a single person who says, here's what the new districts are going to look like. Um, just, you know, for that based, affected area, it won't affect the entire right, state. Right, It would just affect that. So here's where it comes a little bit out of this one, and a little bit out of this one. And we reshape some of these. Um, and I think there are 13 or 14 districts total, both Senate and House that have to be adjusted. Um, and then surrounding districts will have to be adjusted a little bit besides that. But by the time we have two new people put in to replace the two representatives that have left because of elections, April. Yeah. Can things get done before April? <laughs> yeah, I think the thing that can get done before April, Gary, is there's, uh, there's always hearings that can happen. So we could be doing all of our budget work between now and then. We could have budgets set up and ready to go, not voted on, but set up and ready to go, loaded. Um, and um, we can be working on policy stuff that, that could all go through the, the various committees. So you can keep all of that stuff going if people are willing to do it. Well, now, wait a minute. If there is not a majority, who chairs the committees? So the, the way that the that the rules were written as we came into this term were that the, and you know, the, the Democrats were the majority party. So they finally approved the rules and those rules were that included that the speaker of the house does not change unless the majority of the house changes. So even if it's a tie, the speaker of the house will not change because there was the way that the rules are written for this legislative session. And that fault filters down with the committee chairs as well. That is correct. Okay. We got that clarified. Six so what, so what could happen yeah. is, I'm sorry that I interrupted no, you. No, no, you go right ahead. So that what could happen is that um, based on us being a tighter, even um, maybe even equal footing um, in the legislature, but still having a, the Democrat as the speaker of the house, um, it could be that they've decided, oh, we, we really should change some of the committee structure. So there's maybe a few less Democrats on some of the committees, a few more Republicans, that kind of thing. Um, so things like that could change, but I don't, I don't, percip- I don't perceive that there's going to be a full-scale undoing of anything. If you've got a question for State House Representative Brad Slaw, he'll be happy to answer it at 616-395-1450, 616-395-1450. So, Brad, what's the expectations then for the back half of this legislative session in 2024? Uh, is it a little uncertain because of the fact that we still are two, down, two House members down right now? Or 
you know, what what can we expect? Yeah, I think you are exactly right. We there is there because of the change, because of where we're at right at the moment, we're expecting to not see any real big legislation move, um, at least until we get to April. Um, because of the numbers, <clears throat> it's possible that it could move in the Senate side and they could stack a whole bunch of stuff up uh, waiting for the, the right mixture of, uh, and, and numbers to be able to, to push things forward in the, legis- in the House later on. Um, but from the, from the House side, I just don't see very much moving until we get past April. And There'll be some legislation work, being worked on. It won't get passed. But then again, normally in an election year, sometimes things don't get done <laughs> because yeah, it's an election year. Yeah, that's true. But one of the things that we're also looking at then is if none of that happens in between now and April, then all of a sudden we're going to need to have a bunch of stuff get done between April and probably early June because by the time you get to June, it's an election year and folks are going to want to be out knocking on doors, especially when those some of those districts have changed boundaries. There's going to be people out saying, hey, I need to figure out uh, who is my representative and who is my senator if the if the, the boundaries have changed? Um, and then coming up is l- lame duck. And if the Republicans win um, a majority in the in the House, it will change what's going to happen in lame duck. I expect to see a flurry of activity then. Yeah, and then of course the Democrats complained when they were in the minority about things being done in lame duck when the Republicans were in the majority. I have a funny feeling it's going to be the shoes on the other foot. I think you're probably right. <laughs> now, uh, one issue that was you know, talked about and bandied about somewhat in the first half of this legislative session was issues involving local control, and most notably the uh, energy mm-hmm. bill that came through and was signed into law by Governor Whitmer uh, late last month uh, involving... Uh, you know, the state control of lands to allow solar panels and wind turbines to be installed. Is that going to continue to be a theme perhaps in 2024? Yeah, I think it will. Gary. I, I think what what's happened is we've now got the nose of the camp, proverbial nose of the camel underneath the tent. And once the nose is there, the camel keeps coming. And I, I think the um, what you're going to see is a real effort. Uh, I know that related to aggregate mining, uh, so sand and gravel and those kinds of things. I know that the Speaker of the House, uh, Joe Tate, is very interested in um, moving that forward and allowing it to be cited at the state level rather than um, being cited at the local level. And so I think there's going to be this continued push of saying, hey, uh, the state government can do take care of this stuff for us. We don't have to deal with all the local municipalities, um, and we're going to just move forward and we aren't going to care about what you and your property values are. We're going to care about where where can we put stuff and when and why. Not only in that regard, but also some other local control issues that could possibly be changed uh, include short term rentals. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, once you've once you've done this, the first part of that, it, I, if I can take control of of doing it the way I want to as a state bureaucrat. Um, hang on, because it it could go any place. Water, yeah, yeah. Access, mm-hmm. Water access as well. The um, the uh, pet the the Pandora's box is open. Yes, I, I you you use use the camel. I use Pandora. Yeah, I, it's yeah. still the same thing. Yeah, that is a, correct. Six one six three nine five fourteen fifty. If you have a question for State House Representative Brad Slop. A couple of other items I wanted to bring up to you. Uh, Last week, a state court of claims judge ruled that Michigan's income tax will indeed return to 4.25% from 4.05%. This missed a lawsuit from uh, the Mackinac Center for Public Policy and a couple of state lawmakers. I think Ed McBroom up in Vulcan was one of those. Uh, they had sought to keep the income tax lower. The change will add around $700 million more million to the state's general revenue fund. The uh, Mackinac Center for Public Policy in Midland says that they will appeal this decision. As a former county treasurer, which you were, mm-hmm. uh, Brad Slaw, uh, certainly uh, 
can 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 the clock be changed or is it's even if it does get appealed it, it's still inevitable um well i yeah you know the 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 phraseology in the orig, original legislation talks about the current rate will be adjusted and the current rate was the rate at which time it was the the law went into effect and then when it actually reached the certain dollar amount that said, oh, that there's a rollback. So if that was the current, then why would we expect that it is going to get rolled back up? Because that wasn't the current rate. That's a new rate. Uh, so from my perspective, it seems like there's a really valid reason for us to, to say this. It should be a permanent tax rollback and um, that the Government can just say it wasn't. Doesn't seem to make a lot of sense to me, but um, we'll have to see where it goes. It could be a permanent tax rollback, but it looks as if those who want to purport for the increase can say, well, it's a permanent tax increase. Right. <laughs> and so, and I guess that's the problem is we've got a group of folks who continue to say that they're willing to take, to increase taxes. And I, I think that's what our, you know, as we, as we move into the, this year, which is an election year, I think we need to have people saying, hmm, which group do I want to affiliate with? Those that want to increase taxes or those that want to try and keep them lower? Brad, this morning we have received a press release from the uh, State Department of Labor and Economic Opportunity saying that the Michigan Unemployment Insurance Agency received the latest findings from the Office of Auditor General on fraud technology, financial waivers, and other well-documented issues stemming from the COVID-19 pandemic. UIA noted that every pandemic-rooted issue raised by OAG had previously been addressed by the agency and has been either been solved or will be resolved as soon as possible. Major reform takes time. And the highlights of the press release are this. An agency-led crackdown resulted in charges against 162 fraudsters and 90 convictions, more than $90 million recovered. The director of the UIA, Julia Dale, established a UIA fraud fighting bureau led by an attorney recruited to lead fraud crackdown and an antiquated technology system from the Governor Snyder era will be replaced as part of sweeping UIA reform agenda. I know that you and other legislative Republicans were in the vanguard when we had the unemployment issues stemming from COVID-19 three years ago. It will be four years in February and March. Mm -hmm. What do you make of this, shall we say, tooting of one's horn by the UIA? Yeah, well, I... I think there's several things. One is uh, the Republicans were front and foremost saying to the Office of Auditor General, hey, we we should do some investigation about this. So we actually were part of the group that said, because the Auditor General is one of the organizations that is uh, not reporting directly to the governor that's in the bureaucratic realm. And so how do we use that as a way to be able to make sure that we're asking the right questions and we're not allowing things to just slip through the cracks? Uh, the legislature has always used it that way, and it's it's appropriate. Um, I'm glad to see that there's an acknowledgement that there's a problem, that we are actually out there, the Auditor General says there's a problem, and the UIA is saying, yep, there was a problem, and here's what's going on. Um, my concern is if there's $90 million or whatever that number was that they've recovered, but only 90 cases out of 150-some that they saw, how much more is out there that we haven't received back that was given away inappropriately? Um, so obviously there's a bunch more work to be done, um, needing to figure out where where all these issues are and and how do we get it cleaned up? And I would I would easily believe that there was a problem with technology and the information that's out there. Um, how come we're not a, we weren't addressing this in advance of you know the pandemic? Or through the pandemic, I didn't. I didn't hear that we were short of equipment before that. I was already in the legislature. Didn't hear that we needed new equipment to be able to make that work and to protect our assets. So improved equipment or updated, yeah, technology, so that 
Getting the fraud is one thing. Getting the scamsters is another. But here's the thing that I think most people would say is, why has it been so much of a problem for me to get my claim taken care of? We heard and we've seen issues of people, you know, they're trying to get their claim and they're getting the whole runaround and nobody's cutting the red tape. Right. Yeah. And, you know, we've done a lot of it. I, I know that it's not just my office, but the legislative offices have done lots and lots of work to try and um, break the stalemate that's happened. Um, people have put in a claim and it just, it seems to go un, unanswered, unnoticed um, until we get involved. And so I know we've done lots of that. My, my team, my staff has done that. Um, hundreds of thousands of dollars just out of my office alone has been actually gotten back to the people that needed to get those dollars. Um, so I, yeah, I, I don't know. I don't know why it's taken so long, but I do know that it's, it's, uh, it's been frustrating for many people on many different levels. Not only for those who are seeking, uh, uh, making claims because they were laid off or lost their jobs, but the small business owners, especially having to pay into a system, uh, and then they're told they're being told, you know, you didn't pay enough or you didn't pay on time and, and they're having the same runaround too. Right. Yeah. And it's, um, you know, they've, they were putting in all this money and they're being, they're being actually at billed for more because there's now the system is out of money. And so now they're having to say, well, you guys should be putting in more than you were before. And it's how do we kill businesses? Here we go. Let's not get into the growing Michigan Together Council <laughs> here. I mean, we could spend another half hour talking about their findings yeah, for and sure. all that, but we'll save that for another okay. time. I will wrap things up with um, the fact that uh, normally a lot of times we've talked about Brad Slaw having office hours throughout the district and uh, 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 one of the spots that you frequented for office hours, unfortunately, will not have any more office hours. And I know you wanted to touch a little bit about that. Yeah, you know, one of my favorite places in the city of Holland when I was doing office hours was the Good Earth Cafe. And um, Cheryl, the owner, was always arms open, ready to have us in and, and was willing to reserve a table for us. Um, I've always appreciated being there, love their bagels. Um and I know that you've enjoyed a few of those once in a while as well. Um, and I just wanted to say thanks to Cheryl for um, opening the doors, allowing us to do that. And this is her last week. Uh, open The Good Earth will be open this last week. And then I understand they're working on trying to, to sell the business and actually have it reopen here in the city of Holland. We'll have to wait and see if, if and when that can happen. If you need to get a hold of Brad Slaw's office, to maybe cut some of that red tape we have been discussing, you can call the office at 517-373-0841. That's 517-373-0841. And online, go to gophouse.org. That's gophouse.org. And scroll down on the legislative uh, roll down to State Representative Brad Slaw, S-L-A-G-H. Brad, I wish you a blessed new year and your family as well. And if all goes well, we'll do this again in January. Thank you, sir. Great deal. Thanks, Gary. Thanks for having me in. Thank you very much, Brad Slaw, 99.7 and 1450 WHTC. CBS News with Monica Rick, straight ahead, followed by WHTC News. Birthdays, news off the beaten path. And Evergreen Commons report from Barb Visser before the WHTC Midday Report at the bottom of the hour.